Hi, right, class. Welcome back to Chapter 6. This is Part 2, which I've divided into two sections. The first will deal with tornadoes, and the second one will go ahead and we'll deal with hurricanes. So here we go with tornadoes. Let's go with the definition. First of all, a tornado is defined as a funnel-shaped rotating column of air with incredibly low pressure, probably on the order of 600 or 700 millibars, so quite a bit lower than our average. These winds are going to be generated from this low pressure, and they're going to be circulating around, typically in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. Not always, but 99.99999% of the time, they will rotate counterclockwise northern hemisphere. Now, the winds are spinning around at significant speed, probably to be considered a, uh, a tornado. We're looking at about 60, 65 miles an hour, which we call an enhanced Fujita zero on the scale of zero to five. And some of those winds can spin as fast as 300 miles per hour. That would be an EF5. Theoretically, you could have an EF6, but in nature, we've never had that. So typically, we're ranging tornadoes anywhere from EF0 to EF5 on the enhanced Fujita scale. So again, most are going to rotate counterclockwise. Now, even though they can spin with winds going as fast as 300 miles per hour, it doesn't mean they're moving across the ground at 300 miles per hour. They're typically moving at 20 to 40 miles an hour because that's the typical speed for a storm. Now, remember, these are attached to a, a storm. They're attached to a, a cell, a cumulonimbus cell. And the cumulonimbus clouds will typically move across the sky 20 to 40 miles an hour. Now, it doesn't mean the tornado can not jump ahead a little bit because it's basically has the ability to spin around. So we can have some faster speeds for a little while, but it's got to catch up at some point or the storm has to catch up to it. So we're looking at, again, 20 to 40 miles an hour for that storm to move across the landscape. The fastest ever recorded that I'm aware of for a, for a say, long duration would be about 70 miles per hour. So yes, sometimes faster than 20 to 40 miles per hour, sometimes much slower, but on average 20 to 40 miles an hour is the direction, or sorry, the speed that these will be going. Now, these are very dangerous, probably 50 plus people per year succumb to a uh, tornado. They die from uh, the debris, mostly in a tornado. And um, that number used to be much higher before we had warning systems, but now about 50 per year. Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have certain years where we have more than that. We've had some recent years, 2011, where we had almost 700 people die from tornadoes in the United States alone. Now, tornadoes stay on the ground, again, for about 10 minutes or so, cutting a path of destruction on average about four miles long. It doesn't mean that, that you could stay 4.5 miles away and, and be okay, because um, the longest ones have been over 200 miles of destruction. Um, we don't know for sure if that would be one tornado or a series of tornadoes, a family of them, but basically they can stay on the ground. It doesn't matter if it's a new one. They, they, the conditions, once they are right, can spawn one tornado or multiple tornadoes. But again, on average, about four miles of destruction, but it could be way, way, way more than that. I'm going to click out of here so you can't see my face anymore. And well, hopefully I was hoping that would work. I guess it doesn't work. Anyway, so if I'm still there, my apologies. This is what a tornado looks like. Again, a counterclockwise rotating funnel of air. It grows from the base of a cumulonimbus cloud. Within that cumulonimbus cloud, a very large supercell, we would get an area where we see localized counterclockwise rotation. We, we call that a tight circulation or a mesocyclone. And from that, we would see air rushing up and then condensing into that condensation funnel. Now, to be a true tornado, we must have disturbance at the ground level. So once dust particles and, and the like start to be disturbed at the ground, we would actually call that a tornado. If it was not having ground impact, we would call it a funnel cloud. More on that later. So tornadoes. Most are going to have a diameter of a few hundred feet, but they can be as wide as two or two and a half miles. They always grow from the base of a cumulonimbus cloud. They always have a mesocyclone or tight circulation 
associated with them, and they have to have that ground disturbance. They are most common throughout the world in the southern Great Plains of the United States, and in the southern Great Plains, that's the area just to the east of the Rocky Mountains, and the southern portion of that would be like Texas and Oklahoma. That's where the great majority of tornadoes around the world would be encountered, and the most common time would be spring. So let's say May, April, June, that would be mid to late spring, that's when we get the most tornadoes. How do they form? Well, in order to form, they must have warm air near the surface of the ground. So that's why springtime is good because in springtime, the ground is warming up and they must have cooler air aloft. So cooler air above. And sometimes that comes from ramping over. So air from Canada ramping over the Rocky Mountains and sneaking on top of the warmer air that is coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the air also has to be moving at either a different speed or different direction from the air below. And that allows the air below, that, that warm, moist air below, to start spinning. And if you would imagine the warm air wanting to rise, but the cold air above it is pressing it down. Now, at some point, that warm air is going to find a hole through that cool and more dense air, and it's going to be like deflating a balloon. All this warm, moist air wants to go up. As it does that, because it's been spinning, it will spin in two different directions, like a column of air that starts to bend up. And typically, the counterclock, sorry, the counterclockwise rotating air will win that battle, and the whole funnel of air will develop moving upwards in the counterclockwise direction like this. And hence we have a funnel cloud and or tornado forming. So cumulonimbus cloud, a tight circulation and a funnel cloud developing here. Also, when that tight circulation starts to develop, that mesocyclone, we often see the underbelly of the cloud bubbling with instability. So this is a form of supercell cumulonimbus cloud. So these are some of the telltale signs we look for. Again, a tornado, funnel shape, rotating mass of air with ground disturbance. A funnel cloud has not yet had that ground disturbance. So all tornadoes grow from funnel clouds, but not all funnel clouds will become tornadoes because some of them die off before they get that ground disturbance. Interesting cases too. Sometimes we get these tornado-like features forming not on the ground, but over water, especially off the coast of Florida, where we get some very, very warm ocean waters and therefore warm air above them. And that can have conditions for a very mild, by comparison, a mild version of a tornado, but forming over water, we call that a water spout. Back to tornadoes, again, here's a distribution of global tornadoes. We can see the great majority, 80 to 90% or so, are found in the USA. And if we narrow in on where the darker colors are, each one representing multiple tornadoes, we have this area of the United States in the southern Great Plains being our target area. If you want to study tornadoes, you probably want to study them in the southern Great Plains, in that area we call Tornado Alley. Now, yes, we get some in South America, especially where cold air from Antarctica can sneak north and mix with Amazonian warm, moist air. So when that air, when those air masses meet and get pushed over the Andes, we can get some significant tornado activity there. Southern Africa, Australia gets quite a bit of tornado activity. The islands of New Zealand, especially the South Island, because of the Southern Alps pushing air up over the area where South Asia meets the landmass of Asia, so over by the Himalayas and the Annapurnas, and also in Europe. Now, why so many in the USA? Well, in order for them to form, the greatest ingredients to mix would be cold, dry air and warm, moist air. And what can block those two types of air? Well, remember, the cold air is going to form towards the poles and the warmer air towards the tropics. So if you have east-west oriented mountain chains like the Alps in Europe, that's going to tend to block those two air masses from mixing. We don't have in the United States a very large east-west topographic barrier. So cold air from Canada can sneak in the springtime into the central portion of the US and warm, 
moist air from the Gulf of Mexico can sneak north into the same area, allowing them to mix in that southern Great Plains. Number of average tornadoes in the USA by year. You can see almost every state, in fact, every state here has at least some tornadoes over a long time period. So this period is 1991 to 2015. And let's focus here on California, about 10 per year. The, the ones in California tend not to be very strong, or very large, but they can still be quite destructive. And we can see here that the Southern Great Plains, so look at Texas and Oklahoma, this is where we see quite a lot of them. Now this map is a little bit misleading because it gives you the impression that if you're in the northern portion of central Texas, um, you'd be pretty much in ground zero for tornado activity. But if you just went north into Oklahoma, you cut your odds by about a half. Well, the reason that this map is misleading is that tornadoes don't follow state boundaries. They don't go across the border from Texas to Oklahoma and all of a sudden say, oh, okay, I'm a little bit less strong now. I'm not going to be as damaging. So this map might be good for showing that every state has some level of tornadic activity, but it's not great for showing the reality on the field. This map would be better. This is the average number of tornadoes per year per unit area. So in this case, per 10,000 square miles. And we can clearly see here that ground zero is northern Texas and into Oklahoma. So Oklahoma is not spared. In fact, Oklahoma really is ground zero for tornadoes. So the Great, the great Plains extend all the way actually from Canada down into Texas and always to the east of the Rocky Mountains. And the southern portion is really ground zero. We call that Tornado Alley for that reason. This is where you would probably go study tornadoes or chase tornadoes if that was what your goal was, especially in Oklahoma. Now, when would you do that? This diagram here shows us that tornadoes by month, so January through December, are going to peak in springtime. So April, May, June, that is the time that we would experience tornadoes in the USA. So especially, let's say, May. Now tornadoes run the gamut in terms of their types from EF0 with wind speeds sustained at three seconds or more at 65 miles per hour, all the way to those over 200 miles per hour. And the highest ever recorded about 300 miles per hour. So these winds speeds can be quite enormous and very damaging. So EF0, light damage, all the way to EF5, incredible damage, devastating types of, of winds. And it's not just the wind that causes the damage. It's the stuff, the debris caught in the wind that does the damage. That's from pieces of straw, uh, corn cobs, smashed up pieces of glass, um, two by four, studs that have been shattered into pieces and that stuff is rolling around so if you get caught in a tornado there's a good chance you're going to get shredded so but what do you want to do get underground luckily in california we don't have to worry about it so much u.s tornadoes by year from 1952 to 2020 if we can see the 1991 to 2010 average about it says here about eight just over 800 tornadoes per year but in some years we're getting over 1400 like in 2011 we had a major outbreak in april may of 2011 and those ended up being quite catastrophic tornadoes um the type of tornado by year from 1950 to 2011 i couldn't find a, a graph after 2011 but we can see that the great majority of tornadoes are ef0 or ef1 i mean those are destructive enough and luckily we don't have a tremendous number of EF3, 4, 5, especially the fives, but we do have some. And again, 2011 saw quite a spike in activity over here. U.S. tornado deaths in 2019. So over here, we have the number of tornadoes on this scale here, which is represented by the blue bars. So April and May saw in 2019, or the la latest data I have, about 300 and 500 tornadoes for each of those months. So again, that's that's in line with what we said, the springtime phenomena. And the number of deaths um, is on 
not this axis over here. We didn't have that many die, but on the right axis, we have the number of deaths recorded at somewhere around 20 to 25 in uh, March, dunking down into the low numbers below 10 in April and beyond. Now, 2011, um, we all, I also have that graph, and what we see here is we got from March and April, May, we had enormous numbers of deaths in 2011. So again, we go to the right scale over here, and of course, the scale has been uh, um, it's, it's a, a lot larger number on the right side over here compared to the 2019 graph. So look at this in April of 2011, we're looking at somewhere 350 to 400 deaths. And in May, about somewhere between 160 and 200 deaths. And 158 of those were from one particular storm that hit, I believe it was May 22nd of 2011, and that was in Joplin, Missouri. An EF5 tornado on the ground for about 38 minutes with tremendous destruction to uh, two-story and one-story buildings and even concrete buildings. So tremendous amount of damage there in Joplin. If you live in California, you're afraid of earthquakes. You've, you've, you've grown up with the fact that we're going to have those. If you are living in Oklahoma or northern Texas, you live with the fact that you're going to experience or you have a good chance of experiencing some kind of tornadic activity in your lifetime. How to prepare for that? You have to get down low. So basically, you have to have a storm cellar or you have to have some kind of reinforced room towards the center of your house. So stay away from the edges during a tornado, get towards the center of the house, and sometimes the bathtub might be the safest place. Anyway, again, we live in California. The class is taught in California. You have to know a little bit about tornadoes but certainly this is something that we're not going to experience ourselves very much. Okay, um, let's move on to the next subject, which will be hurricanes. So that's coming up next.